And this uh, topic here, this kind of cash flow, rate of return, is one that often raises issues. So um, having taught various courses over the past 10, 12 years, it never surprises me that the difficult concept doesn't sink in the first time, right? So I've taught courses to companies. Um, so these are people that have been out of the university system for many years. And even then, sometimes when you come and teach the material the second day, everything kind of falls into place. So it's fairly normal for a concept, especially one that's not comfortable to us. Uh, this is definitely a more business-oriented concept. It should take a while to sink in. So let's just uh, this is really happy with what we covered yesterday. We introduced this new term, this kind of cash flow rate of return. And it goes by two other names. This kind of cash flow as well. The discounting referring to the fact that you take these kind of money to account. And internal rate of return. The rate of return in, in both those names is, is informative. It's telling us that this is a percentage that's going to indicate how much return we're getting. And when we're talking about rates of return, higher is better. Okay? We want to go for investments which give us greater rates of return. So when we, when we were asking yesterday if you would accept a, an investment with a rate of return of 10% versus 16%, the higher one is, is the better option for all the maximizing profits. So what we were aiming at doing yesterday is finding this interest rate I. That's the rate of return finding that interest rate I so that we can set our net present value sum to zero. And what I what I what I just showed here is and in the handout that's gone around is let's go look back at this exercise where we have a certain amount of money that we have to invest. So ninety one thousand dollars in the first period and then we get subsequent cash flows after that. And what we did was we, we did the discounted cash flow for a given rate of interest in a previous slide. So back, way back in slide 50, if you recall, we went and did that exercise and we used an interest rate of 15% and we calculated a net present value of 20,000. So let's interpret that. In an environment where time value of money is 15%, so our value of money is declining at a, at a rate of 15%, these cash flows Taking into account time value of money are worth $20,000 in my hand right now at the time of year. So this, this money that I invest and all these future invest, uh, incomes that I get, I could exchange all of that for a single amount of money of $20,000 in my hand right now in an environment where time value of money is worth 15%. Next question, what happens if time value of money is not 15%, but is 10%. Is the NPV going to be a higher value? Higher. Okay, because the time value of money then is declining at a, at a smaller amount, so 10% rather than 15%. So those future cash flows that I, I reap are, are going to be discounted at a smaller amount, which will get me a value greater than 20 so if you look at the handout here that you have in front of you, look at the horizontal axis at 10% and you read out and you can see the NPV there comes out to be amount somewhere between 30000 and 40000 Everyone, Everyone else need a handout still? So this is, this is where the counterintuitive part comes in. It's when your interest rate goes up, that your NPV goes down. And, and people feel that that's a bad thing or a wrong thing to have happen. Okay. It's not really. All that it's saying is that if we're discounting our money by a greater amount, it's clear that future cash flows are going to be worth less. And so our likelihood of making a profit then is going to be smaller and our NPVs are going to be lower. Okay. So it's, a, it's an important concept to have in mind that this this trend in general that you see here in front of you, where interest rates are higher and your overall NPV drops, holds. Not every investment does this, but the vast majority of projects do this. The ones that don't do this are extremely exceptional. So 
you you can use as a very good rule of thumb that as interest rates go up, NPV goes down. Okay, so now the next important concept that we need to be clear on. MARR, minimal accepted rate of return. We had a bit of discussion in the class yesterday about what those order of magnitude for MARR would be. So MARR incorporates the concept of the company's risk, and it also incorporates the amount that the company expects on that investment. If it's a very low risk investment in an established market, small MARRs are the norm. If it's a high risk investment in an uncertain market with lots of R&D and uncertainty that, that there may or may not be a payoff from that, companies are not going to tolerate those, those projects unless there's a very, very high rate of return. So the MARR for those types of projects yesterday we saw are in the order of 30 to 50 percent. The key issue here is that once a company has an MARR in mind for a certain type of project, so maybe a new distillation column, there might be an MARR in Suncor that's defined for all new process equipment of a certain amount. So let's say 15%, who knows what the value is. It's a fixed number that's chosen. The company has that number set, and that number is established by the finance departments usually, maybe in consultation with engineers, but generally it's a number that's given and then it's fixed. So what we do then is that's the value that when you judge your projects, you use that interest rate of 15%, let's say. So let's take a look at this project then, at an interest rate of 15%, it's indicating that I'm still profitable. Just a second. So at an interest rate of 15%, I'm going to be profitable. In the order of making a profit of NPV of around 20,000 at that interest rate of 15%. Is the true interest rate in the economy 15%? Is it greater? Smaller? It's a smaller number, okay? So the true environment that the company will actually find itself in when it does this project is the number somewhere around here. Indicating that they're still going to be profitable on an NPV basis. Okay. Now let's say something happens. USA decides to go in and head and go to Syria and a few other catastrophic events that cause money to destabilize and interest rates go up. It indicates that this project is still profitable as long as interest rates are at least 23.6%. Any interest rate below that, this project is still going to be profitable. Only beyond interest rates of that will we start to see negative NPVs. This is why we look for two criteria when we evaluate the project. Firstly, the project has a positive NPV at the, at the chosen interest rate equal to MARR. So first criteria is NPV must be greater than or equal to zero dollars at the time value of money given by the MARR. That's the first criteria that we, we have to have. Otherwise, the project is clearly not profitable if um, NPV is negative at the company's given minimal rate of return. Okay, so if you're not profitable at that minimal rate of return interest rate, uh, that project's not going to be accepted. Secondly, we require that the DCFRR, this value that we find by trial and error and iterate through, in other words, we're simply just doing a root finding exercise and finding when this function f of x equals zero. It's a simple trial and error. When does DCFRR equal, um, uh, sorry, when does that, we find the DCFRR, in other words, we find when NPV equals zero is what I was trying to say. That gives me my DCFRR, and that value we find must be greater than or equal to the MARR. Okay, let's say that this, this line came down a little bit more aggressively and crossed over here, somewhere around over here. Then my DCFRR, let's say it crossed at 10% of the line. NPV was zero at time value of money of 10%. In other words, DCFRR was 
In that case, DCFRR is lower than MARR, and the projects not be applied. In fact, both criteria would have been violated in that case. Sorry, back to your question, Chair. Does MARR increase with the project risk? Does MARR increase or decrease with the project's risk? The project's risk, or the company's, the company that operates in whatever environment, so if they're a mining company or a high-tech company, their MARR that they select will be a higher value the greater the risk. So we, we saw that in the table here yesterday. Uh, let's just go, go ahead back here to slide 62. That as our, as our projects become more risk intensive, our MARRs go up. Yes? Sorry, okay, so if you're a company and you have the option of making like two different projects, that would like one would be the very low risk, like the first one, or one would be the last one, would, they, would you then choose the lowest MARR? Because that would. Okay, that's an interesting question. So, Let's take a look at, at companies, how they typically operate. They, they usually set aside a large budget for projects. And they have, especially in the multinationals, they have each site bid on a certain amount of that money so that they can uh, do, implement the projects. So let's say one site in Canada is bidding on that money, and they're, they're in a project that's somewhere around here. So they're trying to develop a new process or product. They're trying out say a new twin screw extruder to extrude a certain type of product that you've never done before. But your other site maybe in Europe is looking at bidding on money where they're simply trying to boost their production capacity. When that company is evaluating those two investments, they will use a time value of money that's somewhere in that bracket for this project. They'll use a different time value of money to evaluate the project in Europe because it's a lower risk project. It wouldn't make sense to use a time value of money that's a high percentage to evaluate a low risk project. Right? Because then you're going to, you'll never do your low risk projects then, right? Because you, you're always going to show that you're, um, or you, you're likely to find then that your low risk projects are not profitable. So, same company will use different time value of monies, or in other words, different MARR threshold values to judge projects, depending on the type of project. You need, the key here is use the MAR that's appropriate for the type of project you're evaluating. Still, okay, so still a bit of confusion. It doesn't make sense to try and make a project or judge, let's take this high tech process. You expect a rate of return that's 25%, let's say. Okay, so companies, they're putting in a new twin screw extruder on a new plastic resin that they've never used before. They want to see rates of return of 25%. If the rate of return is lower than 25%, there's too much risk involved with that. Okay? If the rate of return was, say, 15%, why would I invest in this? Because there's so much uncertainty. What if it, it fails? Okay? Then come back now to a project that's pretty safe. You know that this is going to work. Right? All you're doing is you're just boosting your existing capacity. Let's say you've got one distillation column, you're adding a second one. Chances of that failing are pretty small. Your rate of return that you judge that against, your MARR, is going to be a number, say, around 10%. You wouldn't use a 25% threshold to judge a lower risk project. Sorry, so what I was saying is like on your graph, if you have a lower MARR, then your NPV value is higher, right? That's so true. then would, why would you risk doing the other one if you're going to get less NPV? Like why wouldn't you always pick the project with the lowest MARR? Because that would give you the highest NPV. Okay, so the question is why would you not pick the lowest? So let me just say that again. So like, if your lower MARR gives you a higher NPV return, right? why would you choose the higher risk one? If okay, this is for one project. This is the curve for one project. Okay, so if I move MARR to be a lower value, I'm going to get a higher NPV. That's clear. But the other project is going to have a different curve. That blue line is not the same. These, this blue line is the NPV for project A, say, in Europe. The project in Canada is going to have different incomes, different expenses. That blue curve is going to be more steep or less steep. Okay, so what we do, what you do if you're evaluating two projects is 
is draw this curve of interest rate I versus NPV. This will be the curve, say, for Europe. Okay, and then the curve for Canada is going to be like that, perhaps. Okay, so very different cash flows that come in. So for the European project, I don't have color chalk here, but let's say that might be the MARR for the European project, and that may be the MARR for the Canadian project. Okay. As long as the DCFRR is positive, exceeds MARR for both, and the NPV is positive for both, I'd invest in both projects. Okay, so this comes back to the tutorial question. You've got a, a pot of money to invest. You pick all the projects that you can possibly invest in that fit within your budget when the NPV exceeds zero and if the DCFRRs exceed MARR. And you pick those projects so that you get the maximal total NPV from all projects selected. Yes? Is there any situation where only one criteria would be not enough? Okay, so this is an interesting question. Marissa is asking, is there a situation <coughs> where you meet only one, one of these two, two criteria? Okay, so work through the combinations. Work with, your, with the person next to you, and can you get a project where NPV is negative at the time value of money, yet you, your DCFRR exceeds MLR? Can both, can one be tr true? So I've tried, so we've got criteria one and criteria two. True and false. Can criteria one be true and criteria two be true? Can criteria one be true and, 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 and false? So work through the four combinations and see if you can improve that to yourself. It's an interesting question. If you can answer that, you've actually understood this material. The first one is Oh yeah. Still have a positive NPV. 
No way. Okay, that's just physically impossible. A DC FRR, the moment it's smaller than MARR, implies your NPV is negative. Okay, so you can never have a, a positive DCRR and a, a, sorry, you can never have a, a positive NPV and DC FRR smaller than MARR. Okay, that, that situation just physically doesn't exist. It's not possible. Can you have the first case? A positive NPV, but DC FRR smaller than MARR. Positive NPV. No. Sure. Okay. So one true, actually that's, that's actually what we just discussed. I realized I switched one or two around. So have NPV positive and, uh, and DCFRR smaller than MARR. That's what this, that's, that implies. So one is true, NPV is positive, And if two is false, the other way of saying that is that MARR is smaller than DCFRR. That you, you cannot have that situation. So this does not exist. <laughs> Now let's take a look at, GF, at this case. If DCFRR exceeds MARR, kind of like what's shown on the board, so that's true. DCFRR exceeds MARR, but have a negative NPV. Okay. So DCFRR exceeds MARR and have a negative NPV. No. Okay, so you can't have those cases. So the only two situations you can have are both are true or both are false. Okay. So when we choose to invest in projects, we look for the usual criteria is simply to look for this, and we know that that one will hold. This one will hold. Okay. So if we then I, so this is where we ended off yesterday, and we didn't get a chance to look at this. Um, we're going to now look here at slide 63, 64, 65, and we'll end up with that, that, with that conclusion. So um, I'm glad that question came up. We're going to end, uh, come to that judgment call now. So let's go to slide 63 and talk about comparing all yeah. Okay, so when we compare alternatives, we always have an alternative, even if you think you don't. Even if your choice is to invest in one project or not to invest in that project, there's an alternative right there. Either you invest in one project or you don't. The do nothing option is still a valid alternative. Okay? The do nothing alternative actually is a little bit deeper than simply really doing nothing. What do nothing implies for a large company is that they can invest that money in a, in, a, in a location or in an investment, I should say, where they get their MARR. So where they get that minimal acceptable rate of return. So they, the large companies do nothing option is so they could invest it in an interest bearing bank account or, um, or some other form of investments. And that's why they selected that MARR at that value. That's one way that they select the MARR, in fact, is they look at what is the least work approach or the do nothing approach for them. What interest can I get with that money? They add on a little bit of a risk factor. And that's in very, very crude terms how companies will come up with the MARR. There's, there's a bit more to it, obviously, than, 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 than being that simple. But the do nothing alternative always exists. So what we we're comparing then is, is our other alternative, our other project. And so when we're comparing independent alternatives, now, what that means is we're comparing project A with project B with do nothing, let's say, for example. We've got two projects, A and B, that are independent of each other, and we've got a third option just to do nothing. So we've got, let's say, a million dollars. I can invest some of it in A, some of it in B, or I can invest it in do nothing, or I can split it through all three projects in some way. What companies will do then is they will 
pick all the possible combinations of investments that lead to these criteria. And that's uh, what we have up here. Now, in fact, we've proven to ourselves already that this NPV exceeding zero when the time value of money is equal to the NARR automatically holds when this second criteria is true. Okay, so if the DCFRR, this fictitious rate of return, DCFRR is just a fictitious number that simply reflects the value on the horizontal x-axis when the NPV curve crosses zero. That's all DCFRR. It's not an actual interest rate you'll ever experience or be able to obtain. It's simply a hypothetical value where NPV sets itself equal to zero. As long as that, that number exceeds the company's MARR, this first criteria will also hold, as, you, as you've shown to yourself. Okay? So what companies will do is analysis for independent projects compares each project's DCFRR to the MARR. So uh, just check your slides. I, in one iteration of the slides, I added those two words in. Checks each, compares each project's DCFRR relative to the MARR. And we'll pick all combinations of the investments that lead to a maximum NPV. So if I'm investing in project A and B, I will split my million dollars and, and give some to A, some to B, so that I get a maximum NPV. Okay. So let's say um, this is similar to that tutorial question that we had. Let's take, take a different example. So project A, B, and let's, uh, let's make this interesting and add project C. This project has NPV equal to $20,000. This project has NPV equal to $30,000. And this project has NPV equal to $40,000. Let's take a look at the DCFRRs for each of these projects. those DCFRRs for the project. And then let's look at the dollars required to, to be invested. Okay, so Project A requires $5,000 to be invested, and it will, over its lifetime, return to you an NPV of $20,000. Project B, $5,000 invested, will return $30,000. Project C, you require $7,000 investment, and you get an NPV of $40,000. So let's take those hypothetical figures. The DCFRR are those three values for each project. The company has a total budget of uh, 10,000. Which project should they select? Eight. Just eight? Well, because uh, one of the requirements is DCFRR should be greater than Which project should they should select? A and B. A and B. Kyle's solution. B and C. B and C. You can't afford B and C. Just C. Yeah. Then no one's asked that question. What's the MARR? If the MARR is so if the MARR is fifteen percent, that immediately takes Project C out of consideration, even though it returns a higher NPV. So am I just making this up? So 
I'd said earlier that if the DCFRR exceeds the MLRR, that the MPV will positive. Yeah, so that's absolutely right. So by making up this fictitious example, I've kind of spun myself into a circle, right? Because that wouldn't actually exist. If MLRR was 15%, I wouldn't be able to get a positive MPV. Okay, so that's that's absolutely true. So this the MARR we know the fact that all these MPVs are positive, the MARR must be smaller than 14%. So that's not not true. So MARR, let's say in this case it's 8% for this company. Now what's your decision? A and B. Okay, so you've got a budget of 10, you can invest in A and B, your total return is is, 40, is 50. So MARR must be um, must be given to you. These NPVs are calculated at the MARR rate. So when I calculate those, that was the interest rate I used. Okay, so when you're comparing the projects, the NPV number you calculate must be um, computed at the time value of money rate with the MARR percent. That's assuming that the MARR is the same. It's assuming it's the same. If it was the MARR was different for each project, we would do the same concept. Yeah, and then. Same idea. If the MAR, so the question is, what if, how would you proceed if the MARR was different for each project? So project A was low risk, project C was high risk. Different MARRs. You'd use different MARR to calculate each of these NPVs. You'd do a different criteria check for this DCFRR exceeding the respective project's MARR. This is the key point here about comparing independent alternatives. So every project is totally independent of each other. Okay. It, there's no relationship between one project and the, and the others. It's not, so for example, we're going to look at in some future classes with projects that are called mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive projects would be, for example, you need to treat a wastewater stream. Either you choose to buy a sedimentation vessel or a liquid-liquid extraction. You're not gonna buy both, right? You're gonna buy the liquid-liquid extraction or the sedimentation vessel. Once you've picked one, the other is out of, out of uh, consideration. So those projects are, are what's called mutually exclusive. What we're looking at here is something different. We're looking at independent projects. Project A and B and C, like the example I give, they're in different countries. One's in Europe, one's in Canada, one's in South America. Right? There, there's no relationship between the three projects. Okay, yeah. Is there a budget list then would you prioritize in terms of highest entity? Okay, so interesting question. Let's say the budget's 12. Which, which projects would people pick? B and C? Or A and C? B and C, right? So the total MPV is maximized with B and C rather than picking A and C. Great. Okay, so that's, that's a, a nice uh, discussion there around alternatives. So. <coughs> Let's just quickly summarize here. We've looked at four different methods. Um, we've learned about more than one method for the main reason that, that companies will never use a single criterion to evaluate their investments. We, in fact, just in this last discussion now, we only we considered NP, uh, DCFRR exceeding MARR, but then we also considered what those NPV cash flows were. Other companies will, in addition to those two, also take the payback into account. Projects that pay back faster than others, all other things being equal, so let's say two projects are being compared, DCFRR exceeds MARR, positive NPVs, then the project that has a faster payback time might be more preferable than the one with the slower payback time, because that company gets the money in, they can redeploy that money on future projects. Okay, so, so multiple criteria are always taken into account. Um, that's why, the, which are recommended, it's, it's, it's very context dependent. And, and what will make sense uh, in your company will be fairly apparent. It's not, not hard to see which one will be used. 
Um, and you'll, you'll see all four of these in your future career afterwards. So there are other methods. If you're interested in this topic, I would suggest you at least go take a look at one other method called the annual work. That's another one that's frequently used. Um, we've not really considered inflation here too much, but uh, that's, that's easily taken into account. And then we've actually considered the IRR function in, um, in spreadsheets, so you can, you can go look at that. My, here's, so here's a, just a tip for those of you that are in the business stream, um, and management stream, I should say. There's a tendency to use shortcut formulas that, you, that you've learned. Those shortcut formulas are great if you know exactly what you're doing. Look, there's one catch that, that you're going to experience, not now, but a year from now, and that's when we start to count that uh, encounter taxes and depreciation. Those formulas will break down then because they don't take that into account. Um, so what I suggest you do is you, you build up a flow sh uh, spreadsheet with period 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Money flows in, money flows out, and don't try to use the shortcuts that will jump from time 0 to the final period. Okay? Just Build up the equations for every period. Um, I've seen last year some exams from people that tried to take taxes and depreciation into account, and the formula ends up being like the whole the whole page. So just uh, just try to avoid those shortcuts, even if you if you feel comfortable using it. Okay, let's take a look now and, and move on to our next topic, which is this concept of taxes and depreciation. So. We've not considered tax at all. Let's take a look at what taxes effect will have on a project. So if you look at a project at timeline, so far we've only considered our periods and money flowing in and out. So here's my, my individual periods. And what will happen is companies will sink a whole bunch of cash into a project and then they'll maybe get a little bit of income in the first year and, um, and so forth. So they get a bit of money coming in, they have maintenance and expenses occurring, all these cash flows occur within a period. And what we've done up to now is we've taken money in minus money out, we've summed it up and collapsed it and reported it as a single value at the end of the period. But there's one important cash flow we've not taken into account, and that's taxes. The government of Canada, or whichever government that you're operating uh, under, in whichever country of the world that, you're, that your corporation is operating, will levy a tax on your company's income. Correct or incorrect? Incorrect. They will not levy it on your income. They levy it. Some companies don't levy a tax. They levy a tax of 0%. But they will always levy it on your net income. So income minus expenses is the tax. Okay. So tax is not on your total income, it's on income after expenses. So the more you, you spend as a company, the less tax you pay. Kind of a little counterintuitive. Wouldn't it be great if our tax returns were like that as well, right? Uh, so companies will pay taxes on their net cash flow. So we, you, what we will do is we'll calculate cash flow before tax, calculate the tax, and then have this in the, far, the last day of the financial year, there'll be an outflow of money to pay that money over to the government. Okay? Uh, governments themselves don't pay taxes on nonprofits. Taxes will depend generally on income rates. And what we'll find though, that unless you're a small business, that tax rate will actually be quite small. Like so, small businesses in Canada pay in the order of 10 to 15% taxes. But for, we'll consider corporations that are large enough so that they're at the high end of the brackets. Uh, and there the value is 25. So please correct your notes, there's a value of 25, it should be 25. Um, I got these notes from Dr. Marlin, and in the United States, taxes are levied at 35% on average. In Canada, our corporate tax rates are in the order of 25%. Please confirm that for yourself, though, on the Canada Revenue Agency's website. Over the next few classes, I'm going to have you refer to the CRA website. Just so simply look up corporate taxes in Canada, and they vary in every province. And every province has a low, low end and a high end. There's a federal component and there's a provincial component. And what you'll see is if you look at all those numbers, on average in Canada, the tax rate, 
corporate tax rate is 25%. The other concept we're going to look at is depreciation. So we're, how many of you probably heard this story, right? Your uncle or your dad or your mom or someone buys a new car, they drive it off the car, car lot, and they say, oh boy, there goes $10,000. Like the car's value has simply depreciated. Okay? Depreciation, what they mean by that is that there's a loss in the value of the car. If I go and try and resell that vehicle now, the value that I can get for it is, is a lower value than what I, stopped, what I paid for it originally if I bought it new. The reason why we take depreciation into account is we recognize that there's wear and tear on our processes, our heat exchanges, our, our pumps. The technology that we bought, the current pump that I may buy uh, five years ago versus the pump I buy now, the technology may be quite different. Okay? I may have greater energy efficiency on modern technology. So, so there's obsolescence, there's depletion, there's failure, there's inflation, that, that all comes into play. That, rec that we recognize that the value of that physical equipment decreases. Okay. Companies need to end up replacing that equipment. So what the government allows is they allow them to depreciate their equipment. And what the effect of that is, it causes a, a reduction in taxes. So, We'll come back to this question. Is it fair that the government allows companies to depreciate their, their capital items, so their equipment and pumps? Like I can't depreciate, um, I don't own a car anymore, but if I own a car, I can't depreciate the value of the car and, and, and reduce my taxes that way. Okay. So is it fair that the government allows companies to do it, but it doesn't allow people to do it? Before you answer that question, consider what the government allows companies to do though. Companies can depreciate capital goods that meet the following properties. That good or that capital item must be used to produce income for the company. That item that they depreciate must have a life longer than a year and it must lose value over time. Okay. So, Discuss uh, quickly with your people around you whether, whether Suncor or any other company for that matter could depreciate these following items. Which ones would be eligible for depreciation? Yes. No, not depreciable. It doesn't 
um, have a lifetime longer than a year. So CEO's jet or corporate vehicle. It's you actually can depreciate that vehicle. Uh, company travel is repeated here. Internet connection fees, no. So those are expenses. Utilities, phone, internet, water, electricity, so forth, not depreciated. So let's come back then and ask this question. Is it fair that companies can depreciate those things but not you? Um, yes, because I mean, the things that they're investing in are what's going to actually allow the creation of jobs. And it also encourages companies to put down, I think, that capital investment because if they know that if they're not getting anything back from how much they depreciate, then they might say it's not worth it for us because that's going to be its value in a matter of time. Right. So this is a definite encouragement for companies to reinvest in new equipment and to keep themselves technologically up to date. You personally could argue your car is making you money, has a life longer than a year, and it's losing value. Okay, would, would the government accept that? Absolutely they would. If you're using that car for your own business, you can incorporate your own company and write off your own car or the portion of your house that you use to run your business in. So we said that companies can depreciate the buildings. You can depreciate the value of your house for the fraction of your house that you use for running your own business at home. So that's only the case if you actually have your own company, not if you're working for someone else. And then you can argue that even in working for somebody else, that's still what's providing you the income. You have to invest in that car to go get the money from that job that you drive it to. But even if you're working for yourself, incorporated or not, you can write off the value of your car in the portion of your house. So you as a citizen have the opportunity to appreciate these items for your own person for, that are for your, your business purposes. So our daily purposes, no. Like if I buy a car and I use it for just weekend and leisure travel, it's not depreciable. Okay? It's, I'm not, you could argue that leisure is not earning uh, money. He's saying it will work. Okay? But travel to work is not depreciable. Okay? If I'm working for another company, that is not depreciable. If I'm working for myself, that is depreciable. Okay? So it's an interesting twist on it, and that's why the government allows you as a personal small business or independent business owner to depreciate those items because they extend the same benefits that the corporations have to you. Okay? But when it comes to your personal life, none of that's uh, fair. So, uh, or none of that's depreciable. So I would argue the government is certainly fair-ish. It seems a little bit that it's unfair that companies can do it on such a large scale. Certainly what I find kind of weird is that companies can only pay their taxes on income after expenses. <laughs> but um, that's, that one, uh, if, if the government did that, they'd never receive any tax income, right? So that's uh, to be realistic there. So the concept of depreciation is fairly straightforward. Now, the government will tell companies exactly what can and cannot be depreciated by a very, very detailed uh, set of regulations on their website. Um, we'll talk come back to this on a later class and I'll show you how depreciation works and maybe let's see that's yeah, probably not what we'll end up with is just perhaps this slide and we'll, we'll come back to the previous one in the next class but just to indicate there's about 50 classes of depreciation on the CRA's website yeah I've just written three of them class eight and of course this is worded as only the government could word it includes certain property that is not included in another class furniture appliances tools costing more than 500. This one is general purpose electronic data processing equipment, commonly called computer hardware, and system software for that equipment, including ancillary data processing equipment. This is a good thing why we're not accountants, right? <laughs> so what we will do though is we'll just simply look at this value, 20%, 30%, 100%, and we'll talk about that in, in five years.